ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, yeah, because that's what we got over here. It's the, it's the Barnum and Bailey's Ringling Brothers Circus. It's a global freak show out there, and that's all we got is a bunch of clowns running the show. And today we're very honored to have a real bright man, a man of honor, integrity, and dignity with us, uh, Mark Morse to talk about what's going on in the world of uh, economics, finance, and geopolitics. Hello there, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much, Gerald. Uh, man, I love talking to you, so I'm so happy to be here with you today. And you are right. It is an absolute clown world out there, and things are falling apart really quickly. It's crazy. You know, I remember being on with um, George Gammon, and he was talking about how he's been reading a lot about the decline of empires because America is in decline. I mean, all you have to do is look around, you know? Right. <laughs> Does it, <laughs> it, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a disgrace what's happened to this country, what the people look like, what they eat, what they've become. Uh, you know, 78% of the people that are hospitalized from COVID, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, so this is not a conspiracy theory, well, they may, well, they, although it may be instead of the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, maybe it's the Centers for Conspiracy Control and Prevention, you know. According yeah. to them, 78% um, of the people that are hospitalized are either obese or overweight. And, yeah. and I don't have to tell you, I mean, you're a man out there in the, in the beach all the time, surfing your life away, and uh, you see what the people look like. You don't have to go out into the water to see the whales. All you have to do is go up on the beach. Yeah. They're, they're floating all over the place. I, I came yeah. back from, from um, Cape May uh, this past September. I was a speaker at Ron Paul's War on Us uh, event. And when you go over the bridge into Cape May, New Jersey, there's a sign that says whale watching. You didn't have to boat, take the boat to see the whales. You know, they were everywhere on the boardwalk. What this country has become is a, it's, it's a disgrace and people just keep eating junk food, uh, piling up on crap. I wonder why I'm sick. I don't understand. Right. So science is the god now. Nature isn't. But going back to what George Gammon said about the decline of empires, at the, or he said three things. I remember the last one was that when they're declining, it's the weak leading the weak. Yeah. Look, and, look at look at the look at the little freaks leading us. Who's your favorite one? Oh, I like Mitch McConnell. Now, Lindsay, did you come out of the closet? You had Graham. That's your kind of maybe guy. Now, I like Nancy Pelosi, a daddy's girl, another arrogant little person whose daddy was mayor of Baltimore in the big time. Got her there where she is. So take it easy, just like all the others. Little Georgie Bush, an arrogant daddy's boy. Yep. One after another, I had that little clown up here, Cuomo, an arrogant daddy's boy. As George Carlin said, it's one big club and you ain't in it. And it's yeah. global. It's global. So, yeah. what's going yeah. on with you? What do you see ahead? Well, you're, well, you're absolutely right. Um, what we see is a, is a breakdown, a collapse of society, um, kind of uh, going back into what you're saying about this kind of collapse of an empire. Um, multiple studies have been done, and really there's really been no empire that's lasted more than 250 years. That's about the cycle. Um, you can kind of break it down into like four stages, which I know you've heard about before, like generational theory, which is uh, the hard times create strong men, strong men create great times, great times create weak men, and then the weak men create bad times or hard times. And so that's exactly what you're talking about, the yep. weak men. Yep. And what's interesting about that generational theory, there's four cycles there, um, the four 20-year cycles. And really what happens is that last cycle, the, the, the weak men create bad times. They're living off the production of two generations before them. Yep. And so they're, they're living without any real world understanding of how the world works. And what's, what's important to understand is that there are natural laws of the universe. So for example, the law of gravity, uh, with enough money, I could suspend the law of gravity, right? I could defy it a little bit, but I'm always going to be holding to it. There's another natural law, and that is the law of sowing and reaping. And so I must produce before I consume. That's just, that's just a law. You can't consume something you haven't produced. Um, but what we have today is, is throughout academia and politics, we have a whole generation of people who have never produced. What they're doing is living off the production of generations before them. And unfortunately, it ends very badly. Well, you just said you, we must produce. 
what are we? What is the uh, the um, United States manufacturing like? It's around what 11, 10, 11 yeah. percent right now. Of how well, what the United States produces today is uh, financialization. <laughs> That's yeah. what we've done. We've we've outsourced all our production. And the thing is that wealth, real wealth, is not money. It's goods and services. And yep. so when the United States used to produce goods and services and export those to the world, we had massive abundance. Um, today, we've gotten rid of all our production of goods and services, the real wealth. And now we only have financialization. We outsource our financial markets. Um, and of course, that's not the source of real wealth. And um, through that process, through this fiat kind of experiment that we've done, it's ruined every area of the life and uh, of the world and the country. And you started out talking about health, and that's a perfect place where we can see fiat money, fiat food. So fiat money incentivizes people to um, cut corners, do everything at all costs to try to make money. And as our money is worth less and less and less, food manufacturers have been forced to use worse and worse ingredients, right? So real food, steak, I think today the number is up uh, year over year, steak's up over 20%. And so people can't afford that. And so the, the food company, the fiat food company will now give us a fake food uh, um, replacement uh, of, of, you know, cheap manufactured goods that are bad for our health, but they do that to offset the gains or the losses, I should say, from the fiat food system. Um, and then through this crony capitalism, then they lobby the government to give us this food pyramid that's completely wrong. It's just upside down, flip that upside down. And so the sugar industry, the processed food industry, they lobby the government to then, uh, you know, increase their profits, which then only makes our health that much worse. Well, you call them an industry, and that's what they are. You know, they, we, we wrote about this in one of my books, uh, Trend, Trends 2000, back in the 90s. And it was either get big or get out. And that was right. the term about the farmers. I mean, who it was Smithfield? Was that the, Smithfield, is that the name of the, the pork one, the big one? Yeah, I'm they're not all, sure. They're, yeah, they're owned by the Chinese now. Well, what we've seen, we, we've seen in the United States, we've seen a takeover of the food industry. So right now we have... Uh, four companies make up over 85% of all the meat packing for the entire country. And what they've been doing is they've been squeezing the ranchers, not giving any profit to the ranchers and increasing our costs at the same time, increasing their profits. But what they've been doing with those profits is a problem. What they've been doing is they've been investing into synthetic meats. Yep. Synthetic meats are full of a bunch of junk, a bunch of processed junk that can't make us any healthier. And so um, while they're squeezing the margins, they're investing into synthetic meat because like anything natural, you can't make as much money off natural stuff. So we'll make a synthetic version of it back to health. Forget your natural immunity. Take this expensive uh, pharmaceutical, right? Uh, yeah. Instead of uh, cannabis, how about synthetic cannabis? Instead of meat that's been good for, for all of humanity, how about synthetic meat? Um, and uh, it's easy to see where this goes and it's, it's not good. Yeah, you know, again, it's the bigs controlling everything. I think it's a, the, the, um, a Brazilian company and a Chinese company out of those four. Yeah. They're there too. Yep, and, they are. And, um, and we were talking before about producing. And again, it goes back to the, again, as I say, this, this is not a government. You use the word government. It's a crime syndicate. Yeah. And people better get it in their heads. If they're stupid enough to believe in Republicans and Democrats, you know, grow the hell up. It's a crime syndicate. There's the banksters, the, banksters. the drug dealers that morons and imbeciles call big pharma. It's, it's, don't believe me, believe Dwight D. Eisenhower, five-star general, supreme commander of the Allied forces, two-term president's farewell address, January 17th, 1961, that anybody could look up. He warns the American people that the military-industrial complex is robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, sweat of the laborers, and future of the children. Hey, you guys did a great job in Afghanistan. Yeah. No, I like Iraq better. No, I love Obama. He did what he did to Libya, destroying the richest country in Africa. Oh, and turning it into a hellhole. And what he did to Syria. I love him. He's so proper. Saleti, you should speak more properly like Obama. He was always folks, folks, as he's folking us and people swallowing the crap. The military industrial complex and big tech. And again, yeah. as you were saying about the four cycles, the weak 
leading the week. Look at the little pieces of crap telling us what to do. Who do you like? Oh, I would. If Zuckerberg came to me and called me out man to man, why, I wouldn't know whether to piss or shit. Oh, I would be so afraid. Oh, oh, and, and if Cook, oh, if Cook came at me man to man, oh, I wouldn't know. Look at the little shits that are telling us what to do. Yeah. One after another. How about those generals? Oh, that Miley clown up there. How about what generals? General pieces of garbage. Yeah. General little cowards. You don't see them fighting. No, no. Nor the senator's son. Send the poor kids who can't get a job or anything else that swallow the bullshit that the big media is sending. And what are they killing? What? Suicide rate only about 20 a day among the soldiers that are left. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sending them to go die in worthless wars. So that's it. The military industrial complex, the banksters. Look at the bankster bandits. Look at that arrogant little piece of shit, Jamie Dimon, which I would call it to him to his fucking face. $37 million last year. $37 million he got, 31, excuse me, $31.7 million salary. This is a crime syndicate convicted, convicted of fraud four times, maybe five, I'm not sure, but definitely four. And one of them rigging the precious metals market. Yeah. They had fined a lousy $900 million after they probably made billions and billions. And does anybody go to jail? Does anybody do time? No, no. We Never. love Jamie Dimon. He's all over everywhere spewing out his bullshit. Oh, did you hear the, oh, you would like this. I know you know all about Jamie Dimon's bullshit about cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's been uh, he's been uh, pretty strong about Bitcoin. As a matter of fact, um, I think it was 2017. He said, you know, it's a scam, it's a fraud, it's a joke, it'll go to zero, blah blah blah. But he said, uh, if anybody at J.P. Morgan were trading, I would fire them on the spot. But of course, uh, J.P. Morgan's all about Bitcoin. Uh, they're helping their customers buy it. They're putting out guidance. They're saying that it could overtake gold. Um, so while he's spewing at the top, uh, what they're doing is is completely different. Uh, but going back to, the, I mean, the banksters is a perfect example. And going back to what you said about Eisenhower and the industrial military complex, what we've seen is that's only continued to get worse. Not only has the industrial military complex gotten bigger, but now we have the COVID industrial complex. We have the pharmaceutical industrial complex. We have the food industrial complex. And so they've all gotten bigger courtesy of the banksters um, and these regulators that allow these monopolies to continue to grow. And really, I think if you zoom out a little bit off of those individual problems, what you really see is the more centralization, the more globalization, the more yep. the government controls things, the worse they get. The more they let off, the better they get. So a good example of this is a lot of people think that uh, after World War II, uh, we saw massive prosperity in the United States, uh, one of the greatest bursts of, uh, of growth. And that was because, uh, you know, uh, the war machine was turned on economic and this and that. I think it was a little bit different. So, you know, in 1945, 1946, when everybody started coming home, what we actually saw is the government downsized. We saw... Um, Government spending drop over 60% from 1945 to 1947. We saw 150,000 government regulators were laid off. And so when you lay off the regulators, you allow people to be free to run their businesses and so, and so forth. And those things led to um, this, this high period of unemployment was apparently going to be a big problem. But really what happened is we saw economic growth grow by over 10% over two years. Uh, we saw the civilian labor force expand by more than 7 million workers. Uh, and so I think what that represents is it shows that in times where the government gets bigger, like we're seeing today, controlling everything, things get worse. And when they lay off, things get better. But right now, we're reaching peak centralization, and we can see the problems in energy markets all over the world, massive energy uh, shortages, prices being hiked, but now that's leading to food shortages, supply chain backups. And the more they try to intervene, the worse it gets. They're losers. They're jerks. They're morons. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know any of my background. I began my career at a graduate school um, working on political campaigns in Westchester County, which is the right. richest county in, in, New, in, in America. And I worked on the mayoral campaign in Yonkers. That's a city of 300,000 people. You know, it's not a little place. Right. And 
And I was very good at it. And I worked on other campaigns and, you know, for district attorney and senators and stuff. And they sent me up to Albany, which is the state capital. And I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate at 26 years old. And this is the guy running the whole operation. So I'm in the Senate. It's a, yeah, the big, you know, the Senate, the rotunda, you know, the, where the, the Senate chamber is. And his office was a mirror of that. And I'm there with, with the governor, the majority leader, in my Robert Hall suit eating shrimp cocktail, you know. And I got to see this right at the top as a young age, at a young age. The guys that are in politics are the people I hated in high school and college <laughs> that wanted yeah. to be class president. They don't work a day in their lives. All they do is suck off the public tit. I mean, just look at the whole Congress. Look at yeah. Biden. He's been sucking off the public tits since he's 30 years old. Right. Never had a job in his life. Never really worked. So they have no concept of how to run anything. And again, as George Carlin said, it's one big club and you ain't in it. Yeah. So they got bureaucrats, you know, that work. So anyway, I'd be in the back of the chamber. We hire a clown to open the door, a sergeant at arms. Senator Frank Smith. Senator Tom, you know, Ellis. Senator... One after another. And my buddies, we'd be bullshitting. They'd leave, follow the senator, pull out the chair, and help him sit down. Right. They come back. I say, hey, man, what's the matter? Cat can't sit down by himself. He needs some help. And, you know, Gerald, you have that kind of an attitude. You're not going to make it here. I said, man, I said, that ain't my trip, you know? Right. I, my, my mother, may she rest in peace. When I was a little kid, she used to say to me, if a situation broke out, even when I, I didn't know what it meant. And she said... I hate cowards. Mm. Yeah. And I got to know what a coward was, you know, and I wouldn't want to disrespect my mother. Although yeah. I've done a lot of other stuff she wouldn't have been happy about. <laughs> but anyway, I quit after one year and nobody could believe I quit. Yeah. I designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology, how to run campaigns at St. John's University. I was the chief government affairs specialist for the chemical industry, killing environmental legislation at the height of the environmental movement. Wow. At 28 years old, I'm staying at the Willard Hotel and putting the meetings on at the Hay Adams. And around 32, I started to grow up. <laughs> and I started, well, you know, all I was interested in was, you know, money yeah. and uh, a lot of other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... And then, so I've been on the other side. I've been with presidents, prime ministers, and princes. I know what the deal looks like. Yeah. When you say the government's doing this, we got a bunch of jerks, losers, slime balls, pieces of crap that all they're interested in is power and control of the power. Yep. That's it. Yep. Nothing else. Eisenhower said it as well. He said, anyone, any man seeking the office of president, you could Google this up, is either an egomaniac or crazy. Yeah. The people that want to run for office are at power hungry little slime balls. And now you could say, men and women, it's becoming more equal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a matter of race, creed, gender. That's a lot of crap. Good and bad comes in all of them. Yeah. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, and I wanted to get back to it, when you talk about the decline of the empire. Production. Yeah. Producing. Yep. You had that other arrogant little nothing of a clown, Bill Clinton, bringing us NAFTA and right. bringing China into the World Trade Organization. Yeah. Lost all our production. You look at China's GDP from 1970 till they came into the World Trade Organization in 2001, two weeks after 9-11 when nobody was watching, their GDP has gone up like that. Right. In, 1990, in 1990, 5% of their population was considered middle class. Today, it's over 35%. Right. They sold us out. You were talking about supply chain disruptions? Where, where, where? Oh, you mean from all the stuff coming from overseas that we don't make over here? 
right. oh, those supply chain disruptions? Yeah. Why aren't we a self-sustaining economy? We have the human and natural resources. Well, I think um, a big a big piece of that is actually what's known as the Triffin's dilemma, which is that the nation that holds the um, reserve currency of the world is forced to send those dollars offshore. And when we were sending products offshore, um, then we had trade imbalances. And so because uh, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world and the rest of the world needs dollars, um, then we're forced to import everything so we can send the dollars back out to the world. Um, and so Triffin's Dilemma basically highlights this problem uh, 50, 60 years ago. It told us about this. Um, and here we are living it. So because we have that reserve currency, we've kind of been forced into that situation. Um, otherwise, uh, but, but that's the problem. Why do well, we have the reserve currency? Yeah, but, you know, I remember when all this happened. I began buying gold in 19, I think it was 77 or 78. But my first buy was 187.50 an ounce. And I remember Carter was president at the time. Inflation was skyrocketing. And they were talking about the trade deficit. Right. Huh. It was tiny. It was nothing. Oh, yeah. It was nothing. And then yeah. when NAFTA came and, and, oh, you don't want those dirty manufacturing jobs. You don't want those. Right. We're going to get rid of them. The middle yeah. class has gone down and shrinks every, well, every year. The numbers come out. Oh, by the way, since the COVID war began, the, the rich, the billionaires only got $8 trillion richer. And in 2020, American median household income dropped its fastest rate ever. Yeah. Yep. So I think I think there was two things at play there. So obviously, one, you're 100 percent right. Shipping all those jobs offshore is a big problem. You can see that all through the Midwest. I mean, it's it emptied out. Oh. Um, but I think it also really goes back to uh, President Richard Nixon severing the ties to the gold standard in yep. 1971. And so I kind of talked about the boom after World War II from 19, you know, the 1950s forward from the 50s to the 70s. We saw massive prosperity, massive growth. Um, but then uh, but that was because we were still on the gold standard at that time. One once we severed the standard of the, uh, the gold standard, that's when everything has fallen off. The You're rails. right. Yeah. You're there's right. a there's a great website called WTF Happened in 1971.com. Um, and basically, it's just a website just full of charts. And it shows everything that's happened from the inequality, you know, the wealth inequality gap growing, but also even the divorce rate, the incarceration rate, uh, you know, real wages, etc. And everything, the whole world basically broke in 1971. And it's just caused this this downward spiral, which now leads today to uh, an article on CNN came out two days ago said that this year, expect to have much less food options at your grocery store. They didn't use the right word. They said that uh, they said that stores would limit the amount of products you can buy. What they really meant was rations, of course. And so it's led all the way to this point that we're at uh, here today. And, and that brings it limited. That means inflation. Yep. And I'll just tell you a quick story. You know, who was the Treasury Secretary under Nixon? At that time, uh, I don't remember. I'm John not old Con enough. John Connolly. Okay. Do you know who John Connolly was? Uh, no. John Connolly was the governor of Texas. Okay. That sat in. He was a Democrat that sat in front of JFK and took the bullet in the back. Mm. I have a photograph downstairs in my office, my other part of my office, um, of me, John Connolly, and his wife, Nellie, in front of the book depository, 1992, hmm. the first time back since the assassination. And he wanted to meet me because in this book, Trend Tracking, Far Better Than Megatrends, Time Magazine, yeah, I had forecast that there'd be a new third party and someone like Ross Perot would be the person. And so he wanted to meet me. How did I know this? Two weeks before the election. Right. Another time I'll tell the story of what happened that day as we were parked out in the limousine. That's the side of the building that you see. We were parked out in front and he told the story of what happened that day. But as we're walking back into the Anatole Hotel, he said to me, I read your book, Trend Tracking. That's why he wanted to meet me. And he said, it's a fine piece of work. And he said, I know your heart's in the right place. He said, well, you don't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> and neither do the American people. 
Because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Yeah. Yeah. This is the guy that took the bullet in the back as a Democrat, was the Treasury Secretary during the time you're saying when they took us off the gold standard. Right. And by the way, he wasn't doing well then. And he was, the oil prices had gone way down. He was living in Houston. He was on the board of directors of somebody. His life had really changed. And as I'm sitting across, we stayed in contact from October to February. I'm sitting across from him, and, I'm, and I said, how are you feeling now? And I know I wasn't doing well. When you see it, I'll show you the picture sometime another time. He's, he's kind of hunched over, and he had all purple splotches on his hands. Yeah. He said, I'm not feeling well. He said, um, they got me on prednisone. He said, they think there's an adhesion in the lung wound. My father, may he rest in peace, worked in the shipyards during World War II and he had asbestos poisoning. Mm. So I watched him die of that lung stuff and they had him on that prentazone, which was totally worthless. So I knew that was the end for Connolly. And I said to the guy who put the meeting together, John J. Hooker, uh, who uh, his great-great-great-grandfather was General Hooker, this guy's from Tennessee. That's how they got the name Hookers. He used to bring the girls around for the guys during the campfire girls during the Civil War. <laughs> I told Hooker, I said, you know, Connolly's not going to be around much any longer. He's Gerald, my boy. How could you say that? I said, man, I've seen the picture before. And he died in, in April of that next year. So going back to what you're saying about the gold standard and, and yeah. what happened, you're 100% correct. I agree with you. Yeah. And I want to mention one other thing. Here. This is um, from uh, the Wall Street Journal, the uh, Financial Times headline. Biden enlists corporate America as supply jam threatens recovery. Yeah, I saw that this morning. All right. You know what that is? Bullshit. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well How about nobody ever mentioning one peep about, oh, your interest rates in the year zero? You've been pumping in trillions and trillions of dollars to artificially pump up the economy? The Federal Reserve has been pumping in uncountless trillions of dollars to pump up the economy? You were talking about globalization and the bigs getting bigger. Oh, what is merger and acquisition activity now at an all-time high? So the yeah. bigs could get money for nothing, buy up everything and keep the Ponzi scheme going? Yeah. You're calling the arsonists to come in and put out the fire, right? They're the ones creating the fire, and now they're going to come and put it out for some reason. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the Federal Reserve, which is creating all the income inequality, now says they're going to tackle that somehow. Yeah. Uh, the, the only way to tackle it is to shut down and stop printing money. Uh, but of course, they can't do that, you know? Um, it's interesting you say that quote uh, from him that uh, if people knew how it really worked, there'd be this revolution, which of course is the same quote that Henry Ford gave us over a hundred years ago when he said that if the American people knew how the banking system worked, there'd be a revolution before morning. So this has been going on for a long time, yep. even before you know Nixon took us off oh, the gold yeah. standard. Well, it's that it's that slime ball uh, with Roe Wilson that brought the banksters in to run the country. Right. And the murderous bastards gave us into World War I. Oh, by the way, he gave us federal income tax, too. And you were talking about the size of the government. We right. should be paying no federal income tax. We don't need a federal government to run our lives. Yeah. That well, was brought in back then. It's, just, it's not like we've had it all, you know, the history of America. This is new bullshit that they're shoving down our throat. Yeah. And, and they have all that power because they have that money printer because of the Federal Reserve. So you talk about, you know, the George Bush being there because of his daddy and all these people, the Pelosi's and so forth. All of that power comes, the power to lock you down, the power to um, put everybody on stimmy, all these things happens because they have that money printer. Um, we wouldn't have these career politicians being there forever getting rich if they didn't have that money printer. And so all of these policies that we're seeing are just a cause because of that one main source. Uh, but things are changing. So uh, I was reading an article this morning from um, one of the governors of the Bank of England um, said that uh, warning, there's a trigger. The entire financial system could melt down. Yeah. And he said it's because Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, they're going to trigger this meltdown. Uh, 
he got it wrong, but he's a little bit right in a sense. Um, it's the same reason why China just banned all cryptocurrencies. Um, they, it's known as the Mundo Fleming um, trilemma. You can't control interest rates, the monetary supply, and the free flow of capital at the same time. You can't do all those. And since they want to control interest rates and monetary supply, then capital will want to leave. And so they can't allow that to happen. Um, and so China banned cryptocurrencies. But in the world, in the United States and the rest of the world, we have this outlet now. Uh, we can go to gold, we can go to Bitcoin, we can go to other assets to get our money out of the financial system, which then takes their power away from them and only <clears throat> you know, leads to that meltdown as, as he's projecting. You know, talking about the cryptos, you know, Bitcoin is really, um, you know, it, it's, we, we had said when it would break over 10,000 and sol solidly it would take off again after it was way down. And now we, we've been saying now for the last, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say in the Trends Journal magazine, I'm going to guess maybe about a month and a half, uh, two months, that when it solidifies over 55,000 and stays in that range and, and keeps bouncing above that range and in that range, it's going to be the next takeoff. Yeah. yeah. And we're there. I mean, that's the way we see it. But, I mean, you're much more knowledgeable about the, the cryptocurrency market than, than I am. I mean, you're, you're, you're very deeply involved in it. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, <clears throat> it's, it's definitely coiling up. It's building that energy right now kind of in this, in this price range, the target that you've su suggested. Um, and what's interesting is that it's almost like the governments are doing marketing for us to move us into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So, for example, I posted on Twitter this morning, um, you know, meat's up 20 percent, chicken's up 18 percent, pork's up 12 percent, uh, you know, baby food's up 5 percent. Everything's up. Well, good thing Bitcoin's up 400 percent. Um, because it offsets that. So your dollars are losing value. They lost 25% of their purchasing power, at, you know, because all these prices are going up. And so people are, are forced to go find these alternatives. Um, so they're kind of doing that marketing for us. And then on top of it, they're coming out and saying, like in China, um, and even maybe in the United States, they're saying, uh, well, you don't have the right to hold your wealth in a way that we don't, we don't have the ability to steal from you where we can't inflate from you, where we can't seize from your bank account. They're putting now these onerous restrictions where they want to monitor every single transaction in your bank account over $600. I know. Like that goes against several laws, but it doesn't matter to them. They're going to go ahead and do it. But all these things only push us to move into those things more. Um, and, and the United States is doing it all over the world. So they're doing sanctions on everybody. And so there was an article that came out this morning where Putin came out, Putin from Russia came out and said that he thinks that um, cryptocurrencies are a good, Bitcoin is a good way to do payments and they're not going to regulate it at all. And of course he's saying that because as more and more people get kicked out of the party, they're going to go find that alternative. Um, and we, you know, as far as the price going up from here, $55,000, there's different ways to look at the price. I think the most reliable way to look at the price is what uh, what markets is it disrupting? Where will it pull value from? Mm -hmm. So Uber pulled value from the taxi industry, the limo industry, the van share industry, right? So where does Bitcoin pull its value from? Well, right off the bat, we know that um, JP Morgan and Citibank put out guidance that it's going to overtake gold. So that's a 10 um, there was uh, two weeks ago, there was the big breaking news of the Pandora papers and all these people are using offshore bank accounts. Well, it's like an offshore bank account. There's 30 to 40 trillion dollars sitting there. Uh, we know half of the bonds in the world are negative yielding. So there's another couple hundred trillion dollars sitting there. And very quickly, you can see how big and how fast Bitcoin could get big. You know, I agree with you. There's no question about it that if the cryptocurrencies weren't there, Gold and silver prices would be, gold would be in $2,100 an ounce. Silver would be in the $70 to $100 an ounce range. But the cryptocurrencies have, have really taken that away from it. And although I still buy both, uh, not silver, I've been buying gold, but uh, and at a good time, by the way. But anyway, here, this is from the Financial Times. Two, one story. U.S. takes Bitcoin lead after Chinese ban sparks, quote, great mining migration. Yeah. So that was a big story. Well, I actually made a video about this, and you'll love this from the historical perspective, but I called it China's second fatal mistake. So what do I mean by that? So um, the whole world um, in, the 18, in the 1800s was moving to a gold standard. 
But China decided to stay on a silver standard. They wanted to hold out. They had all the silver. So as the world moved to gold, they stayed on silver. Well, they lost. The gold standard took off. They got devalued. And in the early 1900s, China was basically forced to abandon the silver standard, go to the gold standard, and they lost their place in the world as like a world leader. Wow. So, so in the since like the 1920s, they've been now for the last 100 years have been aggressively buying gold. China is the largest importer of gold and the largest producer of gold. Everybody can come to China and mine as much gold as you want, but you have to sell it back to China. You can't take it out. Right. So um, rumors are reports are that they have over 30,000 tons of gold. And so for the last 100 years, they've been trying to accumulate their gold to have this new gold backed currency. And what's interesting is just like people mined gold in China and sold it to China, people were mining Bitcoin in China. But the difference was China wasn't requiring those miners to sell the Bitcoin to China. They were allowing the, um, the Bitcoin to be outsourced to the rest of the world. And what happened is even though they had the lead there, as the world is moving towards Bitcoin and China had the lead, they've decided to kick it out to stick with the gold standard. Um, so when um, China, you know, they're launching their own central bank digital currency. They're trying to have a full release when the Olympics happen in China next year. Uh, rumors that they'll have a gold backed cryptocurrency. And so while the world is moving towards cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, they're trying to hang on to this gold standard. I call it their second fatal mistake. Um, but what I think is also a testament to how robust and how strong Bitcoin is, is that over 50% of the network was located in China. They shut it off almost overnight. The network, half the network was shut down. They were forced to scramble, move the network to other parts of the world. But yet the Bitcoin network suffered no downtime, had no ill effects. And now the U.S. has been the big beneficiary, specifically in Texas. They're coming to mine off of the cheap, abundant energy that we have in Texas, which is if the United States embraces this, it could be the biggest opportunity we've had. And we can continue on, uh, hopefully, this prosperity path that we've been on. Here's another crypto story from... The Wall Street Journal, front page. Another front page story. Binance, the world's largest, is that the way you pronounce it? Binance? Yep. Yep. Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, said it would remove the option to buy or sell cryptocurrencies using the yuan in peer to peer trading after this year following a move by China against use of digital assets. So what do you make of that? Yeah, well, the, um, I was talking about China made it illegal. They're trying to right. you know, Im impose capital controls. They don't want to allow people a, a, an outlet, a safety boat to get out of their financial system. And so they've had this crackdown where nobody can buy, sell, own any type of cryptocurrency. And so they're imposing their will even on companies like Binance to make it basically impossible for those Chinese citizens to do that. Of course, uh, if you know anything about human, humanity and, and, and uh, history, you'll know that people will always find a way. There's always uh, alternative markets, black markets that will pop up. Uh, but I think what happens is, you know, in physics, you have an equal and opposite reaction. And the more the governments try to squeeze and hold this tight, the more people push back and find alternatives, which then leads to more squeezing, which leads to more pushback. And it's just kind of this domino effect. Well, I'll tell you what the way I look at this with China. As you well know, China is the first country that's really pushing for a digital currency. Right. They hardly use cash at all. Right. And we're in the digital world. The ma matter of fact, the, uh, I don't know if you saw the cover of the latest Trends Journal. It's crypto. I, I um, didn't see it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, let me see if we got it here. You have that up there, Mike? You see it? Oh, yeah. Crypto techno revolution. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Something so, I've been talking extensively about, a technological revolution. Yeah. Yep. So that's what I'm talking about. This is the 21st century. Yeah. They're going to go from dirty cash <laughs> to digital trash in the sense that now they know every penny that you spent, where you spent it, what you spent it on. They know everything about it. We're going back to how we began talking about the slime balls in control never worked a day in their lives. Yeah. And they want your money in the name of taxes. And you were talking about now with the Biden thing, every every payment of 600 bucks, they want to yeah. know where it went, how you got it, and, 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 and where it is. So going back to China, 
You're going, it's a communist country in total control. The government controls the whole country. Yep. The, they're going digital so they could gain more control. They don't want competition. Right. And to me, that is the big pressure that's going to hit the crypto markets when more and more governments go digital. They don't want competition. Going back to gold, same thing. Taking us off the gold stand, they don't want competition. And to me, that, that is, you know, it's down the line, it's not now. But again, go back to with China when, when Bitcoin took the big hit, when it was trading around, what, $17,000 back in, what, 2018 or something? Okay. And then 17. China started putting all the restrictions on it, and then it went down for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, um, what I would say about that specifically is that China has also banned Facebook and Netflix and Google and so forth. And it sure hasn't stopped those companies from growing. And so I don't think that China is going to have that big of an effect. Um, but jumping back even a little bit back. To Let's the just cover stay on China a minute. OK. And, and beyond Bitcoin and Netflix right now, for example, Disney is taking a big hit in China with their movies and all because, you know, the, the Chinese as we see it, the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century. The business of America has been war. The business of China is business. Again, when you look at, you go back, you go back to the, again, I was talking about the 1990s. Shanghai, Beijing, people were living in shacks. Right. In shacks. Well, but what's, look what, at their transportation system and look at the shit that we got here. The, look the at their thing, infrastructure compared to ours. China's, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. And then people say, well, you know, they have a, a problem with, um, you know, the demographics. You know, they're not having the children that they got 1.4 billion people. What do we have? 332 million. Right. So what I'm saying is. They, that government is there. They are in total control and they will do anything and everything they can to maintain control. And then we go back to how we were started talking about when you talked about productivity, producing. Right. All the European country, companies, the big ones and the small ones, the American companies, they gave China all the high tech and basic industrial need manufacturing that they needed to get where they are. They didn't have any of it. Right. And now all these companies manufacturing are over in China. Oh, and by the way, our second biggest importer of clothing and sneakers, Vietnam. This is yeah. the Vietnam that when I was a kid, Every day I'd wake up, are they going to get me because they were get, sending us all to go fight the Vietnamese. Right. This is the sick mentality of the people running our country. Those dirty commies, you know, we got to stop them until we start doing business with them and we can use the cheap labor. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I, there's a couple of points. And that again, you I'm not anti-Vietnam at all. You know, I, I went over there in 96. I admire the people who were very kind to us. We, I was one of the first Americans that went there. And I, and I launched Occupy Peace because I'm totally against these wars. So I'm saying this about the commies, you know. But yeah. I'm making the point that a communist government is in total control. Right. And, but, and they're going to go digital and they're going to stop everybody else that does. I think there's a couple points there that you made that I'd like to just dig into a yeah. little bit. So uh, the first thing I would say is obviously you're absolutely right. So uh, all those points that you made are accurate, but I think there's a little nuance in there. So for example, um, China was l behind the world, right? They, as you made the case, they were all in poverty. They brought those people out of poverty. Um, but why were they in poverty and why did those people come out of poverty? So they were a communist country. In a communist country, they control everything that you do, including your speech and your thought. When you don't have speech and thought, you have no creativity. 
And then you have no um, ingenuity, right? You have no inventions. And so China was falling behind because they were communist. In the 80s, they had to open up. They realized they were being outcompeted by the world. And they opened up a little bit of capitalism. They opened up some free ports, some things like that. And it was that, it was that introduction of capitalism, I think, that caused the explosion of China in addition to uh, the United States sending them all our dollars. Uh, so it was kind of both of those. Um, but also to the other point that you've made, they, uh, they didn't have anything of their own. They've basically stolen all of our um, technology. Yep. And so what they do is they say, hey, American con countries, if you want to sell on our markets, you have to give us your IP. And the yep. reason why that's in, they, they've done that is back to in a communist country, you don't have free speech, you don't have creativity, you can't invent those things. They can only come from a free society. And so they've been forced to steal those things from us. Um, but what that shows to me is one, it shows two things. One, competition wins. So they were forced to compete and open up some free markets. Two, um, because they're communist ideas, they didn't have the creativity, they were forced to steal stuff. So if they win, um, they won't have any free societies to steal ideas from. Uh, they won't have the never ending supply of dollars and the whole system, I believe, crumbles. So while I see the same problem and it's scary and it's only going to get worse, I believe, over the next couple of years, I believe this all ends and I believe there is massive hope and prosperity on the other side of this. Well, let's go back to a couple of things you said. Sure. Number one, I, they didn't steal it from us. We gave the it to slime them. Slime balls gave it to them. Yeah, that's right. And the deal was this. You come over here, yeah, you can make it, but you can only own 49% of the company. We're going to own 51%. Hey, yeah, right. we'll do it. We can make a lot of profits. We could give a shit. We're giving you everything. Sure. Number two, you said they have no, f f no, there's no free speech, no free thought. It's a communist country, right? Right. Not capitalism. God, kind of sounds like America. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. And we're no gonna... free speech. Who the hell are you to say anything that I don't want you to say on the mainstream media? Right. Who the hell are you to put on YouTube or Facebook what we think you shouldn't put up there. Yeah, it's insane. Creativity? What creativity? Free speech, free thought? In the woke, the dead woke society of America? It's a big problem. Yep. It's a big yep. problem. Creativity's gone. Yeah. Gone. I get Hollywood. What a bunch of shit. And the shit coming out of it. Another, another little arrogant little fuck that... Clooney boy telling yeah. everybody that doesn't get a vaccination how fucking stupid we are and he's out there all over the place. Hey, hey, if a mommy wasn't Rosemary Clooney, you wouldn't be there. So take it the fuck easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that's it's, America today. A little Don Lemon, a little Chrissy Cuomo. Oh, and Anderson Cooper. I, no, I would call him a mommy's girl. Oh, mommy was Gloria Vanderbilt. Right. So going to China, come to America. Look at how our freedom has been lost. I can't go to any restaurants. I don't have a vaccine passport. I can't go to any of the jazz clubs. I don't have a vaccine passport. China? Right. China? We got China here. Yeah. And, and we're going down as they're going up. Yeah. Look at our, look, look at the, look at the infrastructure of this country. You travel around the world. Yeah. I fly back into New York after coming around. Holy shit. Going into JFK. You go down the LIE, all trash, dirty crap. What are you kidding me? Yeah. Compared to the other countries, the rail system we have here. The roads, New York is steel plates everywhere on the roads. We have going down so fast and so hard in this country. Yeah. And unless we have a new movement going, it's finished. Because as I said, it's a crime syndicate in control. You're you're 100 right on all of those things, and it's uh, it's uh, alarming how fast we're we're diving down into the into despair. Uh, but that last piece that you said, unless we have a new system, yep. And so that is what's that's what's being built. I, there's an alternative world being built in parallel right now, 
Um, and I believe over the next couple of years, we're going to see massive change from that. And that's what gives me hope. I, I, I do see that system being built. Um, I do think it's going to change the world. And I do think there's going to be hope. It I has think to happen soon because well, it, 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 it's, and it's I'll tell you why now. I see it like this. When all else fails, they take you to war. You're talking about we're, we're, we're at war. They're, they're waging war against us right now. But I mean against another country. Right. You go back to people forget this. The dot com bust, our magazine, The Trends Journal, October 1999. I forecast that it would bust by the second quarter of 2000. It did, March. George Bush gets elected. His popularity rating is going down the toilet. 9 11 happens. The NASDAQ was down 66%. We were in a recession. People couldn't stand this guy. All of a sudden, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. We're going into Afghanistan. We're going to get that guy Osama bin Laden dead or alive. Yeah. Poof. Everybody forgot the recession, the dot-com bust, and they created yep. the next bubble, the next fake bubble, by a little bastard Jamie Diamonds and, and, yep. the, and the Bank of America. Oh, a crime syndicate? We're talking about the Fed before? They only pumped in $29 trillion to boost up the banking bandits, according to the Levy Institute of Bard College. Secret, secret that never came out, that barely anybody knows about it. Oh, and then we were talking about the criminal system in place and the Federal Reserve. How about that scumbag, arrogant little prick over there in Texas, Kaplan? Yeah. The, the president that just resigned to the Fed board over there in Texas. Yeah, insider trading. Yeah, insider. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars in trades after days. And he, they won't even give the time against, the, against even the mandates of the Fed. He won't give the times when he made the trades. Right. All right. It's a totally corrupt system from top to bottom. From the gangsters on the street to the banksters at the top. So who do you think we would go to war against? China over the Taiwan deal? No South way. Africa. No way. China will win. You couldn't win. <laughs> I think there are 81,000 Taliban troops. Well, I, I, would, I would agree. I mean, we, I'm we just don't... saying, it were 81,000. You couldn't beat 81,000. You're going to beat 2.5 million? China, who has hyper, hypersonic weaponry? Right. No way, no way, no way. What they'll well, and do we're is so they'll dependent go, on their they supply chains. They go after small countries. Okay. More they'll Middle go East. after an Iran. They'll go after, uh, they'll, they'll go after somebody small. That's all they do. They'll go back again after World War II, Korea. Right. Oh, how come you lost in Korea? I think it was the Chinese, wasn't it? Yeah, with the SKSs. Got one of those. <laughs> you know, when you look at the two previous wars, too, this is something that's pretty scary. So if you look at going back, you, you mentioned going after Saddam Hussein, right? And so I remember when we went after Saddam Hussein, everybody was saying, oh, we're the big bully of the world. We're going there to steal their oil, right? Well, um, at the time, they weren't really that much of an oil producing nation. Um, but once we toppled Saddam and put security in place, they've become one of the top oil producing nations in the world. But did the U.S. ever get oil from that? No. no, the big companies did. Who, who got the oil? Well, how about Halliburton with, what's his name, with Cheney, all the money that Halliburton made and all the other companies made, and the military-industrial complex got rich. Right, but now China gets all the oil. Yep. And, and what's interesting about that is you, now you look at, sure, the, the industrial complex made their money, but now you look at Afghanistan. What China. we found out after last year is that uh, we're dependent on China for lots of things, antibiotics, PPP, but also our rare earth elements, That's right. which are a national security issue because we need them for our missile guidance, our submarines, et cetera. So we couldn't go to war against China because we don't have rare earth elements. We really need them. Now, we found out in Afghanistan, which we've been controlling for 20 years, last year, we found out they're sitting on between one to three trillion trillion dollars worth of rare earth elements. You would think we need that. We've been controlling the country for 20 years. We should get those. Now we're out. Guess who's there getting those rare earth elements? I know. China. Right. And so then you go, shoot, are we just the military arm for China going and getting their natural elements no. or assets for them? No, we're, we're a bunch of stupid morons are running this show. <laughs> That's what it is. You got ignorant, arrogant, 
psychopaths and sociopaths that are running the country. Yeah, that's for sure. We that know that. They're, they're dumber than shit. And they've proven it over and over again. So going back to who they'll start a war, that's my concern. When all else fails, they take you to war. And I'm going to give you an example right now. Turkey. All you start seeing central banks now raising interest rates. And Turkey lowered them. Their official, official inflation rate is 20%. Yeah. The unofficial is 40%. Erdogan, the president, had them lower interest rates last month. His popularity is going way down. Mark my words, he's either going to start another war with the Kurds or go into Syria. When all yeah. else fails, they take you to war. Yeah. They're going to do this. What followed the Great Depression? Oh, World War II. Right. Yeah, and it's a, it's a sleight of hand, right? It's like, it's like magic. Hey, uh, look over here while we're doing something you over here. It. And so um, they got to get, get, get the distraction off of what they're doing in the United States to wreck everything, the way they're taking away everybody's rights. Um, and then let's just preoccupy everybody with something else over here. You got it. Yeah. You got it. Because they've robbed us of our freedom. Yep. And by the way, I have a big announcement to make. Uh, as you may know, I started a church. The Universal yeah. Church of Freedom, Peace, and Justice. It will be going live next week. It's all done. And we are going to be offering religious exemptions for vaccinations. Mm. So it's an official church, and it's official, official, we had a top attorney draw up the religious exemption for vaccination. Wow. And I'm doing everything I can to fight for freedom. And as I mentioned to you, I was one of the keynote speakers at Ron Paul's War on Us event in DC in the in, uh, beginning of September, Labor Day weekend. The speaker yeah. after me was RFK Jr. Yeah, great. As RFK Jr. is walking off the stage, now, this is a guy whose father was assassinated and his uncle was assassinated. Yeah. As he's walking off the stage, very emotionally, he said, I will fight to my death with my boots on about freedom. Yeah. And that's what we're in. We are in the fight for our lives. For our and lives. And the only way I see us winning is peacefully and with a new movement, because we could win if we unite. I agree. I agree. I agree hundred percent. And I've, I've pivoted my entire message in my career, um, for the exact same cause. Um, there is no greater cause to fight for at this moment in time, because if we lose right here, uh, we lose. I, I have kids and I'm always constantly thinking about the future life that they're going to have, the future world they're going to have. And so um, there is nothing more important. Um, I typically come at it from a little bit of a financial standpoint. Uh, I tell people it's so that one, we can uh, help people and we also have more options. So I'm helping fund, uh, uh, you know, uh, lawsuits and things like that against the government. I'm helping uh, defund or defend Good. people who have been brought up on charges. Um, I'll, you know, I'll donate to your fund. So we want them to have money for those types of things, but also so I can move. I have assets. I can move somewhere that I could be treated better. Um, and so it's important from that standpoint. But to 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 the point that you made with RFK, uh, I agree 100. Uh, percent I will die on my feet, yeah, not on my knees. I yeah. won't live on my knees. Um, but uh, as 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 uh, as alarmist as that is, and, and because it is that important, um, again, I do believe uh, there's massive hope on the other side. I do uh, believe we if win. If we unite, um, I agree. And again, yeah. you and we I don't both... need that many people. We don't need right. I mean, no, a five percent, ten percent population can turn the tide here. Here. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, yes. keen on setting brush fires of freedom That's in the right. minds of men, said Samuel Adams. That's right. And less than 5% of the Americans were for the, for, the, for the Revolutionary War. And again, the reason you and I are so freedom focused is that we wouldn't be ourselves if we weren't free to be who we wanted to be. That's right. 
My father may, you know, used to say to me, I get in a fight with him. And he say, you little bastard. You think I'm telling you what I'm telling you because I want you to be like me? I want you to become yourself. Right. Not anymore. You won't, you have no right to be yourself. You should do what I tell you to do is the way of the world today. Look what the hell, here. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Right. And endowed by their creator with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The declaration of independence. Happiness? Screw you, what happiness? I'm your little piece of scumbag, gruesome newsome Gavin. Get back in your house. I'm that shithead little fucking Murphy over here in New Jersey. Oh, the Goldman Sachs gangster. That arrogant little prick. Get back in your house. What happiness? And put on that mask, you little two-year-old. That's what they're shoving down our throat. Happiness? Gone. Liberty? Who the hell are you? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Again, we need a re... We need to enforce our declaration of independence. Yep. Yep, we do. Unfortunately, the, the political system is pretty captured at this point, and I think anybody thinking they're going to vote themselves out of <laughs> this is probably, probably mistaken. Um, it's, it's, through, it's through two things, I think. One, it's through um, disobey. Yep. Um, hun hundreds of millions of people have died in the last hundred years because they obeyed. Yep. because they obeyed. And so it's time for civil disobedience. I see all those people marching in the street. I think, wow, how much more effective it would be if they just disobeyed, if they didn't comply, that. And number two, what if they all just went to the bank and pulled their money out and put it into yep. Bitcoin? No, I, agree. Gold, right? I agree. I agree. So, it's a, so that's, a, that's defund the government. Yep. And we can defund them and we cannot comply. Uh, you know, the Berlin Wall fell because people stopped complying. Yep. And so it's it's, well, it it's also, that. yeah. It also stopped because they went and more came. They didn't leave. More right. came, went, and they didn't leave. Taking these protests, yelling, yelling going out, and screaming, and going home means nothing. Right. So thank it's, you very much. Oh, before we say goodbye, what advice would you give the uh, listeners here? Well, uh, the first advice I would give is a shameless plug because uh, I am having an event to help people figure out how to navigate this and you are coming to speak and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Um, and so we're going to be getting together live in about a month in Miami. So everybody should come check that out. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I think um, we need to, as, uh, as you've made the case, uh, and I like to make over and over, I say, I'm not trying to wake up the sleeping sheep. Yeah. I'm trying to wake up the sleeping lions. Yep. And so we don't need everybody. We need a, a vigilant minority that can wake people up, as you said, keep um, starting brush fires in the mind. And so um, have faith, continue to educate yourself, continue to talk to those around you, educate, motivate, coordinate, disobey peacefully, civil disobedience, um, and pull your money out of the banking system I'm and defund you. the government. I'm with you. I only, I only try to keep enough money in the bank to, you know, because I got a business running, you know, to pay yep. the bills. That's it. That's it. And put it in other assets and get it the hell away from you. What, how stupid can you be to keep your money in the bank when they're paying you nothing to keep it there and they're making money on you? Yeah. Criminality it's, right in front of your face. Yeah, it's insane. Thank you so much, Mr. Moss. See Thanks so much, you Joe. in Miami.